Hello and welcome to Prairie Pulse. On today's show, Matt Olene had a chance to visit with a very special guest. Coming up later on Prairie Pulse, we'll hear a music performance, a holiday favorite from Andrew Suki. But first, our guest is Luke Larson. He is the author of an interesting new book. It is called Keeping Company with St. Ignatius, uh, Walking the Camino de Santiago de Compostela. And uh, Luke is with us on Prairie Pulse. Before we get into the book, Luke, tell us just about your background, where you're from originally, uh, and how you, how you came to write this book. Sure, thank you. Thanks for inviting me to be here with you today, Matt. I am um, originally from Montana, and that's where I met my wife. Uh, I was a hospital chaplain at the time and uh, in Billings, Montana, and um, I met my wife, who was a nurse at the time. And then we, um, um, through my, my advancement, through my career into uh, mission integration, uh, making sure that our hospital system is true to its mission and values. That's, that's my job. Um, and so that brought me to um, Eastern Oregon and then to Fargo um, for this position. And uh, my wife and I actually live uh, pretty close down here in a downtown uh, condominium. And we've been here for seven years. And uh, as an executive with Catholic Health Initiatives, the name of my organization, I had the, the I was eligible to uh, sign up for a um, sabbatical, a sabbatical leave, having been with the company for at least five years. And the sabbatical is a six month uh, time away. It, it can be used for research or volunteering or any number of things that are self enriching and that would en enrich the organization. So I, uh, my proposal was to walk the Camino de Santiago with my wife as a, um, as a spiritual experience, but you know, as, a, as, as kind of a total renewing experience. So that's how it came about. Mm. Well, that's a big undertaking. It, uh, it is. And what, what is this, this path and why is it significant over in Spain? Sure, and it's, it's a medieval pilgrimage route that in, in medieval times, people came from all over Europe. You know, obviously they didn't have a bus or train to take them to a, you know, uh, demarcation point, but they um, uh, walked right out of their homes and then walked from whatever that distance was to Santiago. And, um, and it was very popular in medieval times and then lost some of the popularity, but is now uh, rebounding. And such that in, in uh, 2010, when my wife and I did this, 500-mile uh, pilgrimage, there was uh, a quarter million people that did it that, that summer. Um, so it was kind of crowded in certain spots. But it's a, um, it's a pilgrimage route, that, a Christian pilgrimage route, that, that uh, takes people to Santiago, which is Spanish for uh, St. James. And so it's the traditional um, burial place of St. James where St. James is believed to be entombed. So. And what's the significance of St. Ignatius? Is that who you're talking about or is that a different saint keeping company with St. Ignatius? Sure, and that comes about okay. with St. Ignatius of Loyola. And right. part of the pilgrimage goes through his Basque homeland. And so, you know, you get a sense of the, the hills and the, the sheep speckled, uh, you know, hillsides of St. Ignatius's background. It comes about with my desire to, to keep company with him, to companion him on a journey uh, with my Jesuit background. And so uh, St. Ignatius was the 16th century founder of the Society of Jesus, which is commonly known as the Jesuits, you know, a religious order in the Catholic Church. Um, I was with the Jesuits for eight years in the early 80s and 80s and, and 90s. And, um, uh, so it's that, that spirituality of St. Ignatius and, and background that, that prompted me to want to um, companion him along this pilgrimage route. So it's kind of ironic, isn't it? I mean, where you have mm -hmm. a traditional pilgrimage route that, that is to St. James's uh, burial place, you know, in the, the Cathedral of St. Uh, Santiago, St. James, uh, to accompany St. Ignatius, but, you know. I let St. James come along too. <laughs> okay. Now your wife came with. Yes. Well, talk about that decision. Do you guys have kids? We do. What, they're adults. What, you do? Okay. All right. So I was like, you who's going to take care of the kids? Right. Adults, yeah. So. And they're adults, and we do okay. have grandchildren. But uh, the the impetus for the the 
pilgrimage actually came for our, from our adult daughter who became interested uh, looking at the this pilgrimage route on, online. And then um, uh, my wife started going, well, maybe I should do it. Maybe I, we could do this as a mother-daughter thing. And, and originally I was saying, fine, you know, let that be a mother-daughter thing. I didn't really uh, want to do what traditionally is thought of as a pilgrimage today. You get a whole bunch of people crowded in a bus and they go to shrines, you know, mm -hmm. in some remote mm -hmm. place and put candles next to statues and stuff. That didn't appeal to me. But as I started reading more about the, the pilgrimage and had this sabbatical opportunity come available, then I became interested in too. And then and, um, in the meantime, then our daughter uh, took a new nursing position and then couldn't do it. So, so it wound up being my wife and, and me doing it. And talk about some of the highlights along the way. This was all walking, correct? This is all walking. All, okay. How, Once, lo how long did it take and what were some of the highlights? You bet. So um, it, we did it slowly. It, it, this wasn't intent. We had the time, you know, we were blessed with the time. So we did it in 48 days and, and we actually included some, some uh, times where we'd walk like 11 miles up into a mountain valley to, to be with a um, monastery for three days. So this was really intended to be a, a walking retreat. Slow, take it easy, take a break day here, take a break day there. And um, so uh, we, we, didn't, we didn't rush through it. Um, but the, the highlights would be, um, you know, certainly visiting the, the huge cathedrals and the, their magnificence and all of that. But ironically, some of the smaller churches that, that were, um, you know, it, it, it just had a real presence to them uh, really tugged at our hearts, you know, and, and, and we felt a, a, a real connection there. Um, but, you know, really the, the Camino is all about the people. It's a cliche to say it's not about arriving in, in Santiago. It's not about the arrival. It's about the, the, uh, the journey. But it's really about the people. So visiting with people at, at uh, afternoon break stops or, you know, that kind of thing was, was the real joy of the experience. Is this something a lot of people do? I mean, did you meet people along the way that were also doing? It's called the way, right? That's right, the, exactly. Were there other people? doing this walk at the same time you were doing it? Or were you the only ones? No, quite a number. So, but we didn't go with a group. Right, I mean, I it know. was just two of us, but, but yes. And, and the, the fun thing about that is you, you, you and I might meet on um, a Monday of the week, and then you're, you say, oh, I'm gonna stay at this next stop an extra day or two, and then we go on and then, but then, a week later, you and I catch up again. I mean, so that was kind of the fun of, of um, meeting up with, it seemed like old friends along the way. So there were um, upwards of, of a quarter of a million people that one year that we went. So there were quite a few people on the road. Of course, as, uh, as you start out, we went over the Pyrenees of, of, um, from France to uh, Spain and then all the way across Spain, Th those first uh, kilometers, you know, those first days and stuff weren't quite as crowded, but of course as, as you got closer to, to Santiago then it was much more crowded. And uh, uh, where did you stay along the way? Did you, have a, did you have it mapped out ahead of time? We're gonna stay at this place and this night or how, how does that work? We had, it, we had it roughly plotted, and guidebooks give you some pretty good indications of, of the, the uh, best places to stop type of thing along the way. But we, um, we, didn't, we didn't stick to a real strict schedule. In other words, if we said, oh, this is a really nice community, a little beautiful church, let's spend a couple extra days here, or a monastery where, you know, we, we felt comfortable and wanted to stay in it. So we didn't stick to a, a strict schedule. Um, but I'll tell you one thing that we did as a little bit of an older couple. We did not uh, always choose to stay in, uh, they call them albergues or uh, refugios, or the other name is s simply a hostel, you know. But you could get those that are just filled with a hundred of pe hundred people in you know mostly younger folks that are in bunks and and that kind of thing 
we had a an experience with that that thankful thankfully we didn't have but somebody that started at the same time that that we did the the woman had 85 bed bug bites in one night Boy. they swelled to cover her entire body and that kind of dissuaded us from staying in some of the uh, the places that you know were a little iffy in terms of their cleanliness and and that type of thing so as an older couple we we chose more of the uh, more upscale right. uh, hostels and and they call them rural houses you know as you might imagine in a smaller town here a, a smaller um, bed and breakfast kind of place mm -hmm. Now you mentioned in the book the actor Martin Sheen made a movie called The Way. The Way. About he did this walk as well or his son did. Emilio Estevez, tell us about that and you think it really kind of highlights what it's about. And, and um, uh, Martin Sheen uh, put his endorsement on the front of my know, book and so that, I had yeah. this time, this <laughs> chance to talk with him and that was a highlight of my life of course. But it, the, the, um, the, the movie The Way really is true to the experience of the Camino. So when you're watching the movie, you, get, you see uh, friendships develop and they get closer. Uh, I mean, they become closer as, as friends. The, um, the motivations for starting the Camino might be completely different at the start from what people uh, wind up um, uh, saying that, you know, they got out of the experience. So, um, and that, that, you know, even in the movie, you get some glimpses of them just kind of being irritated with each other, you know, yeah. and, and that's all part of the experience. Yeah. But it's, um, um, I think it's a great movie. And I, I you know, I, I don't say that because right. Martin and I <laughs> have this little bit of a connection there, but it's, it, it is true to the, to the experience. Maybe a two part question, Luke, what did this journey do for you? Uh, you know, emotionally or spiritually, and part two is, did it take a toll on you and your wife too, physically? Sure, and and it was intended to be a, a physically, spiritually, you know, all of the the whole holistic kind of experience, and it truly was that for me. Um, you know, a, a kind of a, maybe a silly one, but I lost weight, which was a good thing. You know, uh, as you'd imagine, walking the equivalent of a half marathon every single day. Uh, but then just that uh, sense of being away from my work and, and the, the daily activities that are the normal routine, just to be away and then to have that time to reflect and, and um, renew, you know, relax and, and all of that. So um, it was a highlight of, of our lives, you know, and, and my wife and I would love to do it again. So the, much of the hardship actually came from um, my wife's sore feet. Mm -hmm. <laughs> she has uh, bunions and, and um, you know, she'd do pretty well the first maybe eight miles and then her feet became pretty pained, you know, pretty painful. Uh, and and um, so that was just, you know, just, you know, loving somebody and, and n never wanting to see them hurt. and. And there was a couple of times when my wife would just be finishing those last couple kilometers and crying, you know, and, and, uh, but, you know, it, it, it was her desire to continue. I mean, you know, it, it, we, um, we did it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, and what happens when you finally reach Santiago? What is that like? Do you know, that's an, that's a, it's a great question because people experience it in different ways. And so the guidebooks uh, tell you to, to don't um, get your expectations up too high because you may be disappointed. And quite frankly, my wife and I did kind of have a little bit of a letdown that day when we were into uh, circling the, the courtyard and going right up to the, to the um, cathedral because it it was a sense of it's over you know it's and this is it and and is this really it you know and is this what it's all about all of those kinds of emotions and it's interesting even after the Camino where we're we're in Santiago for a couple of days and then we we continued some of our travels in other places in in St. Ignatius's hometown all of those kind of places after the Camino 
we, we walked, <laughs> even when we didn't need to. We were just um, not anxious to, or let, let me put it this way, we were reluctant to um, give up our identity as, as pilgrims, walking pilgrims. So. Why, do, why are pilgrimages important in the church, and are they still important or not? Yes, and, and it, it is an ancient spiritual practice, and it is um, one that was seen as suspicious uh, for a certain time in history. Um, I, I couldn't give you the, the time period, if it was decades ago or a century ago, where it, um, if you think about it, a pilgrim that is migrating around the countryside isn't under the, isn't at the diocese, isn't at the particular parish or the particular place that they, they normally are. So they're kind of free um, and, and free to experience life and their spirituality in, in ways that they might not have. So there was some suspicion at, at one time with, with pilgrimages. But there's such a rebound now, and I, I know of no one that that would say that um, that would discourage. Um, but it's not only Christians, you know. Um, uh, Muslims go on pilgrimage, and and uh, actually most of the world great religions, the practitioners of the world great religions, um, all have some form of pr pilgrimage. Um, and tell me about the decision to write the book. Was that always a plan to write a book about this, or did that come after you got back? Uh, you know, and and I had in my mind that I I, I like to write, and I, I I've always wanted to, to write a book, but the um, it, going into the the pilgrimage, I did not think I would write a book. I thought I might write some articles uh, about the the experience. But, um, and in fact, I was suspicious of people that were on the Camino where you knew that they were interviewing people or, you know, I'm gonna write a book about this kind of thing. That, that seemed to me like it was a, a distraction, you know, it weren't really in the moment. But as I, as I um, walked along and I had more of that sense of kind of Effort, effortless spirituality. You know, I, 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 I kind of felt like I'm walking with Jesus and walking with Saint Ignatius and walking with Saint James, real naturally, like you and I taking a walk together. You know, it, sometimes we talk, sometimes we just walk in silence. It's all good, and that insight of walking as a way of just simply companioning somebody was the impetus for the book. And so I, um, so as I walked along, and you know, as the as the pilgrimage progressed, then I started thinking a little bit more about writing the book. Um, and what's been the reaction to the book, Luke, so far? From well, people or readers? You know, um, uh, very good. Uh, the um, uh, I'm not getting a lot of specific feedback. Some people are saying that they are going to walk more as a way of simply companioning Jesus, uh, incorporate that more into their, to their um, daily routines kind of thing. Um, the, um, you know, I think uh, we're talking more and more with people that want to uh, watch the movie the way mm -hmm. and read the book sure. and kind of see those as, as right. kind of companion pieces, um, those kinds of things. How, how did the walk change your life? Just the, the um, that sense of uh, God is always with us. Uh, we don't, it, that um, it doesn't have to be all about my effort, you know, it's not about me kneeling in a church and going like this, and and am I doing this right? Am I praying enough? Am I, am I in good stead with the Almighty? All of those kinds of things that I really can um, have a, a a relationship with the Lord that is a true companionship, a true just kind of sharing our time together and such, and um, and so and, and that seems like maybe a, a simple insight. But it, it, 
it has a profound effect because it's um, it gives me a way of of, of you know com just companioning Jesus. Mm -hmm. So about thirty seconds left. If people uh -huh. want the book, where can they get it? How can they get it? it the uh, Paraclete Press is the is the publisher, and and go to their website, and they typically have some pretty good discounts, thirty percent off now. Otherwise, Amazon.com and, and Barnes and Noble. Um, or okay. your favorite bookstore. All right. Thanks, Luke. Thank you so very much, Matt. My guest is Luke Larson. The book is Keeping Company with St. Ignatius, Walking the Camino de Santiago de Compostela. Stay tuned for more. Andrew Suki was raised on a beet farm and wheat farm in western North Dakota, where music was a big part of her family's life. She participated in festivals, music theater, and several bands before moving to Minneapolis. Andrew visited our studio and performed a special holiday song with her husband, Andrew, Silent Night. One, two, three, two, two.
Well, that's all we have on Prairie Pulse for this week. And as always, thanks for watching. Funding for Minnesota Legacy programs are provided by a grant from the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund with money from the vote of the people of Minnesota on November 4, 2008 and by the members of Prairie Public.